Welcome to the Finding the Magic podcast, where books come alive. I'm Tricia Copeland, a fiction author and host of this show. If you love books, finding great reads, and hearing about the story behind the story directly from the authors, this is the place for you. Whether you like fantasy, science fiction, dystopian, or romance titles, I think you'll find something to love in my playlist. Listen in to discover something magical about a book or two today. Today I am here with author CJ Hosack. And we're going to, is it okay if I call you Kathy or would you rather yeah. call you CJ? Either one is fine. <laughs> okay. We'll call her Kathy, but her author name is CJ Hosack. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Tricia. And the buzz on the street is that you have a new release, correct? Yes, today. Oh, today. Oh, my gosh. I can't believe it. I feel so special. <laughs> awesome. March 19th, 2024. Is this your first book? Yes. Yes. Well, even double kudos. Congratulations yeah. to you. Yeah, this, is, this is my debut. So how is it feeling today? Um weird <laughs> sort of like giving birth letting your baby go into the world <laughs> yes you're out there you're raw for everyone to discover right letting it go although I had to let it go when you finished it you know when you finish that you finally turn it in you have to like let it go <laughs> well the beauty of ebooks though right if you find something you want to change it's just a keystroke away <laughs> Yeah, well, my publisher will have to do that, but yeah, hopefully. A few hopefully. key strokes away, we'll say. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. So are you traditionally published or indie published? Um, Indie. Okay, fun. And I know your fantasy, is it young adult fantasy? It is. I know everybody is these days. <laughs> I mean... I, that's what I mostly read, and that's what I mostly write, but not everybody. <laughs> but. It just seems like everybody, every post I see is young adult, young adult. I'm like, oh. Well, probably everybody. because that's what you're paying attention to, and Facebook is paying attention to you, too. <laughs> that could be, yeah. Yeah. That could be. Well, tell us all about your book. Well, um, so... I I wanted to write a story. I had this idea. Um, well, I wrote this short story that was about um, my brother and I when we were younger and the, the silly things we do, to, you know, um, when our parents were out um, and um, on a date. Uh, our parents actually dated. They never married, but we kind of grew up together. So I consider him my brother. And um, we... Uh, I had this story and everybody kind of liked it. Um, and I, I sort of put it away for a long time because I had written a novel and nobody could read it. And so um, I had decided that I couldn't write. Um, it just wasn't my talent. Um, and this was pre-internet before you could really like get all this, you know, you can watch stuff online now and, and learn so much. Um, podcasts like yours <laughs> but um back in those days I would have had to like go to school and I had young children at home and I was like I can't do this and so I gave up I just thought I'm just not talented um I can write a historical academic paper but I can't write prose um and I'd written this short story and it got fairly good and and then um fast forward about four years ago um, I stumbled across uh, an author online who has a, uh, who teaches at the university, posts their lectures online for free. And I started watching it and I went, oh, wow, I am an author. <laughs> I am a writer. I can do this. And so I wanted to take this little story and I wanted to make it, um, I wanted to maybe do like middle grade, like short little stories. And then I decided you know, it's got to be fantasy. And since it's sort of based on me and my brother, um, I'm adopted. And so 
I decided the main character was going to be adopted and um and what kind of magic would really highlight that for her and of course it had to be a hereditary magic and um and you needed to prove your bloodlines in order to to inherit it and so um I in all the interim um, when my kids were when I was about to be an empty nester, I um, took, I went back to my master's um, in history um, with an emphasis in public history, which is teaching history to the public instead of in a classroom. Um, so a museum is public history, an archive is public history. Um, and so uh, I decided, well, this is a cool thing. If I could have like a, a building that's like a library slash archive slash museum that holds all the family history information and um and uh, so it's not like your your neighborhood library this is like you know all, if you have to the only way to get power uh, a magical power is to prove your bloodlines and that would automatically make this library a center of everything and power and so um I have my my young adopted girl who I, I didn't want to do a, a like chosen one thing I didn't want it to be um that um she you know was an orphan or something like that I I wanted it I really wanted to ground it in um she has an adopted family that love her and care about her and it's not that she's not loved it's that everyone around her she's surrounded in her community now granted her little community isn't a sample of the whole world and she doesn't really recognize this but she's surrounded in this community by people who do magic and it's she feels when you're adopted um even though you're loved and told you were wanted and all those things, you still, there's still this disconnect. Like you don't feel quite like you belong. And um, so she has that going on and even more so because her community does, has this hereditary magic. And so she's like, well, if I can find my family, if I can find my ancestry my bloodline she's not necessarily looking for a new family like a birth her birth family exactly but if she could find her bloodlines prove that she has this ancestry magic she could actually belong and fit in that is a really neat premise yeah i know my dad is adopted and yeah and he i mean he loves his mom and his mom was our grandmother we didn't know any other grandmother but, and he was always very insistent that, you know, he didn't want, need to know his parents, but I could always sense that, that, you know, there was just that something missing or something, you know, like that maybe needed to be found out. So that's really neat to write, to write that story. I'm sure that many adopted people can really relate with that. And, and even people that maybe just don't feel like they fit into their community as well. Yeah, exactly. One of my writing community friends, he was saying, well, I just don't feel like I fit in my family. I feel like my whole family, even though I'm, you know, their blood, I don't necessarily feel like I fit with them. You know, everybody else is kind of like this and I'm kind of like that. And so I'm hoping, yeah, that it'll, it'll resonate with anybody who feels like has a difficulty with feeling like they belong so yeah and and that can transfer to so many different situations it might transfer to school or being on a team or feeling left out in in lots of different situations especially as a young adult I think we all have those feelings from time to time whether it's based on personality or based on you know I don't like the color blue and you do <laughs> or whatever those don't, I mean obviously that's a simplified version I shouldn't even make that comparison but um <laughs> But neat. So what is your character's name? Um, her name is Ren. Um it's a shortening of um my name. I'm actually Catherine. So um her name is Ren and um 
at the opening of the novel, um, her mother brings her to meet the guy she's dating and he has two boys and um just like in real life <laughs> my real life and um yeah she um gets really connected with them and and um they help her along her her the one um the one brother um who I pattered after my brother who who's I'm really close to um he uh a little bit of a rebel and a little bit of a you know and he's like you know you should because her mother tells her you don't need to study find your family history and library you know you don't need to have that kind of magic to be special or you know to be fit in and there are other ways, you know, magic isn't everything, you know, that you can have fantastic talents. You don't need to to have that. And she's, but he convinces her, or she has an opportunity to, um, someone comes to the library and he's taking on students, a researcher, and he's taking on students and she has an opportunity to apply for it. And she does it um, behind her mother's back. <laughs> Okay, this, is, no, this story is sounding very familiar. Did you write like a short story that was very similar to this in an anthology? Mm -mm. No? no, okay. Maybe I, so I wrote a story in an anthology that, that was about magic in books. And mm -hmm. there was in that, in one of the short stories I read in that anthology, it was about this depository of books. And the girl had to get some information in in the depository, so she um, work decided to work there, so she would have access to all of this. But then, you know, she steps across the line and gets in trouble because you're not really supposed to be reading the books if you're working there. Anyway, sounded very yeah. simple. But what is the name of your book? It's called The Slayer's Magic. Slayer. Um, that's because I, I know I went through it took me a long time to come up with a title for this I was sort of hoping someone would come along and change it at some point but the slayer refers to the dragon slayer and it's his magic that is being inherited by everyone okay. and so but does she maybe this is a spoiler and you can't tell us does she inherit the same magic as everyone around her or is she different magic we don't know that right that's that we'll have to see okay <laughs> it's, a, it's a this is going to be a trilogy so that will unfold as we okay. go <laughs> so you finished the first book and are you already working on the second book I actually so I wrote the first book in 2020 okay in a month and a half and then I started pitching it um but while I was pitching it, I wrote book two and three. Oh, good. And then um, when I finally found uh, an editor, a publisher who wanted who wanted it um, last year, um, he looked at it and recognized a problem that I knew was in the book. Um, the first book I wrote was very middle grade. And the books two and three were YA, <laughs> which, and there wasn't really that much time in between. Okay. So he's like, you really need to age this up. <laughs> and so I completely rewrote it from scratch last year. <laughs> oh, that's big. <laughs> but kudos to you. I mean, like for sticking with it for that long to get published and to you know, and and it it kind of sounds like it made sense to make her character a little bit older, so it flowed with the rest of the series. And yeah, um, it did. Yeah. I knew it was a problem because um, I I've been talking to people about it for years. You know, as I was pitching it around and having different discussions with different people, I I knew it was an issue, um, and I was sort of hoping I'd get away with it. <laughs> And then I can't. Um, surprise. Actually, he, my publisher didn't actually ask me to completely rewrite it from scratch. I just realized that's what needed to happen in order to do the things that he wanted me to do to it. 
I realized that the voice, the whole voice was too young. Okay. So yeah, that makes sense. Completely yeah. redo. Yeah, it's so interesting. I was just talking to an author and she had a YA series and she wanted to make it a little bit racier, like new adults. So she just added racier scene, like bonus racy scenes, but she called it the same book, but it's like the book young adult version, the book new adult version, and you can buy both versions. I was like, I'm very smart. <laughs> so that's I, I listened to that. I actually listened to that podcast. Yeah. Okay, Liz Simpson, right. Yeah. So she was super I love hearing like new ways to do things and new ways to expand for your readers so they can get, you know, more of experience if they want that or if they don't want the racy scenes, they can get the YA clean, you know, just like yeah. so very fun and so when will the second and third books come out um so my so my publisher does a kickstarter in june every year for um the books to help with the cost of publishing um the books that he's putting out so um book two will be in this year's kickstarter i am imagining it'll it'll be the same I'll, it'll probably come out about next march ish in a year from All now right. Yeah, and then the next book. Um, so so what happened was, um, I realized I I just realized that I must be like a discovery writer, um, to some degree, a pantser because sometimes when you're a discovery writer, your draft is your outline, <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, I realized with book two and three that I have. In book two, it was mostly Ren. It was all mostly her story and and our other character, Zoe. He was just sort of hanging out. And then in book three, it was reversed. And so I'm going to smush them together so that it's more even. So oh, okay. I'm writing it. <laughs> Rewriting it. That's okay. I mean, it sounds like you're continually making them better for the readers and Hopefully. The best can be, yeah. Fine. That's my hope. Yeah. And so you touched on this a little, I mean, you talked about where the books came from and where the idea came from, and I think that's super cool. But you touched on the fact that at one point you didn't think you were a writer. So what is, what were you, what was your job before? Or what did you do before? Sounds like maybe you were a nonfiction writer? Um. Yeah, well, I'm a history major, so... Okay. Um, when you're a history major, you, you, they train you to write a historical article. That's what you're trained to do. So, um, I, I've never really worked in the history field. Um, I've done some volunteer stuff at, our, at my local museum. Um, I've done, um, I'm into, uh, historical costume quite a bit. I love, um, one of my favorite things and I know everybody you know Twitter is like a bad name sometimes but one of my favorite things on Twitter is the um the historical um the historical the dress historians oh I have to find that stuff that they post I love it but anyway <laughs> so a friend of mine and I um who's who's got a degree in fashion design um we worked with the museum and and recreated um a historical piece from a photograph um so I've done some dabbled in some of that um, mostly um I was a stay-at-home mom I coached preschool gymnastics for 13 years um while I was you know with my kids growing up and so I was looking for a career. That's why I went back to school. Like, okay, I'll empty nester. I want a career. And the whole public history thing, that, that market is flooded. Um, <clears throat> because that's how they pitch that degree to people is like, oh, you don't have to be a teacher. You can work in a museum. But there's so many people out there <laughs> <laughs> wanting to work in a museum. So, and so I ended up just doing regular office jobs and I was having a really some really horrible experiences and but then I when I finally figured out oh I'm a writer I don't 
need my day job to be you know my career per se um, I can just do something to make some money that doesn't require a lot of brain power and then I can come home at night and write <laughs> I love doing that too. I'm with you on that one. Did you integrate any of this fashion history into your book world? I'm interested in knowing about the world. Is it set in like contemporary times or is it more of a fantastical feel? It's a second world fantasy. So it's a different world, but I, um, I based it off. I live in the Seattle area. And I based it off the Puget Sound region. So like there's islands and each each um, magical, each house, ancestral house lives on a different island. Okay. It's sort of like the San Juan Islands in my mind. Um, it's not super fantastical. I, I, I try to put in a lot of the the pine trees and the water and the and the, you know, the things that I know um, and the the dress like for the guys it's more um, late 18th century okay. you know with the waistcoats and the long jack coats that are embroidered and for the girls it's more um, more late uh, not quite Victorian but um, later in the 19th century I kind of mixed it up I just like those silhouettes a lot so <laughs> uh, fun and so I'm, I'm assuming there's no technology there's no cell phones or computers we're, we're kind of like more of like 18 1900s type technology still yeah yeah um it, it sort of varies because when I was trying to, and I'm not super great at this, but I was trying to think, well, if you have magic that does fire, would you really develop certain technologies if you could have it at your fingertips, you know? And so the technology for like the library and preserving um, the the documents and the books and things like that, like they it's very almost modern <clears throat> because they deal in temperature control and they deal with because if that's their focus that's where they're going to make advancements it's it's heated by convection um so heated water um, run beneath the floors you know it's so um some things yes some things no they don't so, like, well yeah that makes no sense I mean if that's where their power comes from and that's what's most important to them they're going to develop technology around how to protect all that so yeah and if you could just make fire and build a <laughs> build a fire yeah. and heat your water then you don't need like an electric cooktop stove or a microwave or anything like that so yeah and and there's a travel magic so you can travel using magic so you wouldn't necessarily have come up with like cars and that sort of thing so they do use horses and and uh carriages and stuff for those who don't you know have the magic but you can also if you hire someone to take you somewhere with travel magic so yeah that's what i was wondering okay so you have the different are, is there an unlimited number of ancestral lines or do you have a certain number that there's 12 there's 12 okay and then does every line have you said it's a different kind of magic so they can do different they have different powers like maybe one has fire and one has travel and do you have you yeah, yeah each, about that. each house each house has one okay so and then when you um when you so you have one from each parent okay you get you inherit one magic from your mother and in her main house so if she's a um if it's a mother then it's her magic that came from her mother so it's okay. the matriarchal line and if you're and then you have one from your father which would be the patriarchal side 
So whatever his father's magic was. So you have one from each. And if you're a girl, then you will pass on the, the mother's. Okay. And if you're a boy, then you'll pass on the father's. Okay. But it's okay for them to marry people from different lines. So that's not forbidden or yes. anything. Okay. And the only thing's forbidden is to marry within your same house. Okay. Within oh, your so, inner inbreeding. Oh, well, yeah. But you mm -hmm. can marry somebody from a different family that's your same line, right? Does that make um, sense? I, yeah, I haven't really thought about that, but I, I have it so that you don't do okay. that. Yeah. That's so, so interesting. Something different. Yeah, and this and this your book theme all about magic fits very much in with my Finding the Magic podcast and your main character is finding her magic. So that's super yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah, so I have a um series called the Kingdom Journals and in that series the witches are granted power through ancestral lines, just through their family lines, but there's um four lines that were created by the four different or four of the different archangels. So one has like wisdom and one is truth and one is light and one is, I don't remember what the other ones, but there's four of them. <laughs> and that determines like what your major like abilities are too. So uh, kind of similar, but you, you developed it a little bit more than I did. So very cool. Yeah, I sort of had to in order to like have the full family history thing where you would like, do research and figure out you know where it goes and and I drew a lot of family history trees using this magic to try to figure out how that would work and do you end up are you going to end up putting those in the book or did you put those in the book once she finds out or that would be cool <laughs> I wanted to I'm like because one of the one of the issues I had in in beta reads was um people wrapping their brains around this um the 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 biggest struggle that everyone had was um uh so my main character Ren um her parents her mother was married previously and had a son and then um, they divorced and then she married again and they adopted Ren and they separated and then she's dating another guy and people cannot wrap their brains around this. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> and so I, one of the things I thought is I don't need a magical map. I need a family tree. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> that would be good. well. And you could always do this like family tree is like a bonus thing for your readers. Like, you know, once you've read it, here is your bonus or, you know, follow the, or put it on your website somewhere, follow the family tree so you can figure out. But, okay, so Rin has to find out, does she have to find out who her mother and her father are to get this magic or just her mother where the magic is being passed down? Um, I mean, if you only find one side, her best friend is adopted too and her her mother is actually the curator of the library. She holds um, a lot of power. Um, and she did the research and only found um, one side. So okay. she only gets one of the magics. So if you don't find both, then you only get one. Okay, but, but it would be okay if you found she only found her dad? Because she's a female and it's handed down from the the mother but if she only finds her dad then she would just have her dad's magic correct yeah. mm -hmm. okay. i'm getting the magical system little by little here i know it's it's a little complicated uh, and everyone's like oh you really need to explain how this all works and i'm like i really don't want to info dump so <clears throat> my book has epigraphs at the beginning of each chapter which hopefully fills all these little things in for okay everybody. interesting by yeah. epigraph, sorry, I'm not, don't, I'm not remembering what that means. So that's just a little like quote or something at the beginning, right before the chapter starts. Okay. So these are all quotes that come from in-world books or documents or um, like journal articles. And then it, it gives their direction on how to find it in the library at the okay. end. Okay. You know, like you would. From, from uh, your book though, not from like somewhere else. Um, no, no, yeah. these well, are all um, made up 
Right, from your library. Yes. Okay, yeah. very cool. Okay, but yeah, but so sometimes you don't want to overload the reader at the beginning of the book. Like, these are all the rules of the society because you're like, oh my gosh, why? I don't even know if I need to know all this. Yeah. You know, it, it's too front loaded if you tell me the whole rules in the beginning. And I don't know, I think it's better to kind of splatter it out and learn things as you need to know them because probably I'm not going to remember everything you told me. Well, that's just my brain, but I'm not yeah. going to remember everything you told me if I, unless I know the context of why I need to know this, right? Yeah, so. that's my philosophy. I like books that, um, you know, drop breadcrumbs, you know, they'll like introduce this thing, you know, they'll give it a name or whatever, and they won't explain it. You know, and you're just like, what is this? You know, and then they just sort of hint at it. And then eventually you'll see it in action and you get it, right? right. I love that, <laughs> actually. Um, but a lot of readers don't. So uh, I, I've had to put in more breadcrumbs than I originally did because readers like they some people I had someone who wanted me to front load it like you're talking about um because she just likes to know all the things you know so she can understand the story but it's like well, a lot of people don't though so. <laughs> yeah I mean yeah that's why it's good to have a lot of beta readers and it sounds like you have a lot of support in writing this book so that's very fun yeah yeah it was it was uh um, I went to Surrey International Writing Conference actually in 2020. So they did it virtually online. And I just somehow ended up in the right breakout room on Zoom. And I got swept up into this group of people. And, and so they're amazing and awesome. I love them. <laughs> that's very cool. That's, that's great that how that happens organically. Yeah, definitely in 2012. Well, I started this podcast in 2020 because I was like I need to talk to my author people and this yes. is a good way to talk to them right and then like let everybody know about them um so I love connecting with authors and learning about their process and their characters and their worlds and yeah and it's just so fun to have that support and that camaraderie and just hear about all the different like creative ways that people think up stories and write and yeah so, well, so what is next for you if these these three books are written are you like thinking of another series or or nearly written I guess I should say um originally I was thinking of writing an adult book that's like the same time period but you actually see it from the adult's perspective instead of the kids um I'm not sure if I need to do that anymore the way that it's been rewritten um I don't have a lot of people talk about you know they get these ideas when they're in the middle of something and they want to like you know get pulled towards that I haven't had that <laughs> <laughs> um I will definitely write more this is this is this is me this, I'm, I've found my people in my place um but I'm not sure what's gonna come after this series yet uh we'll see um uh, my brother is also a writer um and he wants to write something in my world actually so oh, cool. um that might be coming down and, and we want to collaborate on something too so um that might be, be what be next is we want to collaborate on something in our my world too so yeah fun yeah it's great to expand the world like that and get in other influences with other characters. And that made me think, now I'm gonna round back to you talking about being a pantser and your your draft being your outline. So when you started, I guess you, you said you had three books written. So did you know where you wanted to end or what her final, you know, the final finale wanted to be? And then you filled in all the different stages or did you have an idea more of what stages you wanted to go to and then figured out the ending? Um, I knew where I wanted to end. I knew how I wanted it to end um, in the end, you know, all three. I had um, some vague things that I 
scenes and things in my mind that I wanted to hit. Um, it wasn't until I started writing the next book that I would, that it would like come together like, oh, oh, okay, that's this and this and, you know, trying to figure out how to make, you know, you want something to happen is like, how do I make that happen? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how how in the world building because if the world building is like this then it would be too easy you know so how to make it so that it it works and I I felt I, when I was writing getting towards the end of one book then I would start to have ideas for the next book um, Fun. Yeah. I always go back and re-listen to or reread my books right before I write the next one so yeah yeah and that's after, one. sorry go ahead that's what I'm doing right now. I'm rereading book two and three that are my original drafts. And I'm going, oh, yeah, we're going a totally different direction. Well, not totally. <laughs> it's still similar. It's like my rewrite for this. I mean, the theme's the same. Where I end is the, it landed is the same. It's just how we get there is very different. So. Well, kudos that's... to you for going through that process. And now I lost my other train of thought, but that's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. I knew what I wanted to ask. Is there any like love, background love story in these in the series? Um. So, um. So her brother, the brother character, um, he's gay, and he's um, definitely attracted to one of the other characters in the book, and they sort of um date ish in this book um he's gonna get more in the next books coming um uh and and in book two um well in book one uh in the slayer's magic ren there's definitely attractions to different boys, but she doesn't really land with anyone yet book two she will start having date that was why my original draft of book one didn't work because she goes from really feeling middle grade to like dating. Oh yeah. <laughs> you can't be 12 and then be 16 the next year, right? Yeah. Oh, it doesn't work that way. So there's definitely, you know, boys she's attracted to in the first book. Um, and at least one who's kind of interested in her, but she doesn't really start dating until book two. So well, at least there's that little bit of romance because sometimes you talk to readers and they're like well I need a little bit of romance in there or yeah, and that's more true to life too right so it doesn't have to be yeah. the main theme or the you know the main point of the book but if there's at least a little romantic line they like that yeah there's Good. definitely some interest um you know and and there's definitely a certain boy that's shows his you know care and affection for her um but nothing you know there's only one kiss in the book and Zoe gets it <laughs> so <laughs> um yeah it's it's still I, I suppose in a YA scale it's still a little on the young side um but it's going to you know age and evolve as it goes right um, for the series so yeah <laughs> no if you're in your spicy romance not gonna have it <laughs> no it's, it's YA so we don't get that spicy in way but well, actually I took a class at Surrey last year um and they were and they were like I guess oh, some I guess they, they like surveyed um some surveys were done of teenagers and a lot of them don't like the spicy stuff so, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. It depends on maybe your maturity level or what you're focused on. I know that as a, as a, when I was a YA reader, I would have been kind of like, oh, okay, I'm going to skip over this, but maybe that was my Southern upbringing. So, <laughs> could have been a little bit of both there. Well, I, I grew up in Southern California. I felt the same way. <laughs> Well, southern, but different coast, right? <laughs> well, I am so excited for you and your release of The Slayer's Magic by mm -hmm. C C J C J. I got that right, right? Wow. C J Hosek, H O S A C K. Can you find us, or 
find us. Can you tell us where to find you and your books? Um, so I have a website, um, cjhosack.com. Um, uh, the book's on Amazon, of course, and um, you can find it on Barnes and Noble. Um, um, and book club, book club, something, yeah, book club. I think that's the name. <laughs> <laughs> I can, to, I can like and friend you on BookBub. You can you can go into your indie bookstore and order it um, yeah. if you want. Um, you can go to your local library and request them to purchase it. Um, and they will hopefully do that for you. <laughs> if it's in the budget. Um, so yeah, you can get it. And uh, there will be an audio audiobook forthcoming um yeah i have uh my publisher works with an audiobook publisher and um they have bought the rights for all three books so there will be an audiobook they're a little backlogged right now <laughs> i'm a huge audiobook fan so that makes me excited <laughs> well yes. fun we'll have all the links for your books and where to find you in the description for the podcast. And thank you again so much for being here. Any final words that you want to like tell us about? Um, yeah, I just, uh, I hope that you enjoy it. Um, and Ren's ride and, um, her, uh, exploration of the library and, and, uh, trying to find where she belongs. Well, I'm going to one click today because it is your release day. So I can read the book. <laughs> and I will, I will definitely review for you. So. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been Thank great. Thank you so much for being here. I'm glad you found me. Yeah. Good night. Bye. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Finding the Magic podcast. I'm your host, author and podcaster, Trisha Copeland. And I love getting behind the scenes. If you like the podcast, make sure to subscribe and stop in each week, discover new authors and books. Thanks for listening. And until next time, keep finding the magic.